how to use flowcharts and an entire adventure scenario today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about playing the ultimate game of D&D. Level up your game by subscribing and click the bell icon, and you'll be informed when we upload new videos every week. Today we're talking narrative flow charts, and it, they are an indispensable part of your DM toolkit. It doesn't matter whether it's a homebrew adventure or it's a, a professional adventure published by Wizards of the Coast, you still need a flow chart. One of the things that's overwhelming as a game master is trying to anticipate where the characters can go, and then you wanna make sure that you don't miss any clues, you don't overlook them that you give them to the characters as they go through the adventure. There are three types of stories that you can tell as a game master. The linear story, the open-ended story, and the matrix story. The linear story is what players often refer to as railroading, which is a pejorative for they really don't have any choice at all. An adventure where one room just leads to the next, players are generally unsatisfied that. Role-playing gamers want at least the illusion of choice. Now, you can have the open-ended storyline, but that's a nightmare for game masters to run. This is where the player characters can go virtually anywhere. But the problem is, you may have designed a dungeon and they skip it all together in favor of just walking around the town and you haven't planned that part of the session adequately. I have seen dungeon masters do this type of game, like this type of improv, but they tend to be the one in a million dungeon masters who are just like crazy good. I could never do it. I think the best option is the Matrix storyline, which provides structure for the player characters. It's clear they can go here or there, and it, and it can kind of keep them on track while giving them the illusion that they have a lot of choices. So the trick is to design scenarios in such a way that your players feel as if they have a choice in the matter, but you're really pretty much controlling everything and know where it is they're going. This is covered on page 44 of this excellent book, Tracy Hickman's XDM, Extreme Dungeon Mastery. Now, I know people, I've recommended the book, and some people find it really jokey, uh, but underneath the facade of comedy is like game design gold here. I think this is the best book about RPG game design I've ever read. And on page 44, we have The Matrix Story. Here the characters start at point A, and they can choose to go to B, C, D, and then to E, H, and F. And they can bounce around in a number of directions, but it ultimately ends at X, Y, or Z. Now, I don't have 26 encounters. I'm only going to show you five. But it's the premise is the same. So today I'm going to show you this scenario I've designed myself. If you're a fan of my campaign update videos, this is going to provide an entire scenario that you can use at your table. Also, it's going to weave in a lot of the concepts I've discussed in earlier videos, including story structure, three NPCs, and stop flipping through rule books. So here's the scenario. It's called The Demon's Skull. So the scenario begins at A, the Dripping Dagger, a seedy tavern in a seedier section of town. There, the player characters meet Scabs, a low-level thief and member of the Thieves Guild, and he's sweaty and nervous-looking, and he fears for his life, and it would be best if the characters knew Scabs before this. Maybe you introduced him two or three sessions ahead of time so that he doesn't come out of nowhere. And he's really nervous, looking around furtively, and he reveals to the characters that he's found the location of a dangerous artifact, the Demon Skull. It's been stolen by a notorious street gang called the Swine Gang. That's when he reaches into his cloak, pulls out a scroll tube, and holds it out to the characters and says, look, if anything happens to me, and zip, he's hit with a poison dart and falls dead on the spot. Now, this is a tavern filled with dangerous looking people, any of them who could have committed the murder. Call for a perception check. The player who rolls the highest is the one who perceives moving in this sea of dangerous looking cloaked figures. There's one particular cloaked figure who's just moving out the exit door toward the back of the tavern. Players should take their turns in the order of the highest perception roll to the lowest perception roll. And they have a choice to make. They can pursue the assassin out the back or they can search the body. If the characters pursue through the back door, they go up a staircase leading to the second level, and there's an open window at the top of the staircase, and there is a bloody nail with fresh blood on it, and they should conclude that the assassin probably left that way. 
They have seconds to get out the window and pursue. Outside is a heavy fog. There's low visibility. No weapons or spells are going to be effective because you can't see that far. They can hear the assassin's boots running away and they have moments to decide whether they're going to pursue. If they do, they have to make a series of dexterity checks as the assassin jumps from roof to roof trying to avoid them. Players who insist on their characters wearing metal armor at all times must roll at disadvantage. Same if they're carrying a weapon because they need both hands free to balance themselves and to grab onto something if they slip. Describe the rooftops as slick with the slate shingles breaking off as the characters run across them. The difficulty for the first jump is four. It's a narrow alleyway. The next jump is 8, then it goes from 12 to 16. Notice those last two are highlighted. That's because I'm not rolling for the assassin to make the first two jumps. They're automatically going to make them. But for the next two, I'm going to make them in front of the players so they know I'm not predetermining the encounter. If a character fails the jump, have them make a luck check, DC 11. And they suffer only minor scratches, but they're out of the chase. If they succeed, they land in a cart filled with either hay, if you're feeling kind, or manure if the player is being annoying. If they fail that luck check, they fall three stories and are knocked unconscious, taking 3d6 damage. Again, they're out of the chase. There is a slight chance that both the assassin and the player might make that last jump. If that happens, say a fog surrounds them so the other characters can't intervene. The assassin will engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat for two rounds. The assassin's AC is 14. He's not wearing armor. If the assassin hits the player character, call for an 11 dexterity check, and if they fail, they fall off the building into a canal. If the character hits the assassin, he automatically slips and falls to his death on the cobblestone street below. Searching the assassin's body reveals he carries no money. He has a green scorpion tattoo on his wrist, and his lips are stitched shut with black thread. He also carries a broken blowgun, car from ivory, and a single dose of zoom, a drug that increases speed and dexterity. In the event that the assassin gets away, have him accidentally drop his blowgun so he leaves a clue behind. Details on the assassin are found in the gray sidebar. He is a member of the Green Scorpion Death Cult, foreign murderers who work for hire. If you've seen my video on three NPCs, you'll remember one of those NPCs is the Sage Archetype, a contact who knows everything and advises the player characters. If the players have such a contact, they will reveal the information about the cult. Otherwise, you may allow a rogue or a wizard to know this information. No history or arcana checks are required. They just know it. And no, they don't know how or where to hire a green scorpion assassin. They just know they exist. Either outcome leads back to B, searching the body. Scab has no heartbeat. He's killed with poison. He carries 3d6 gold and a 10 gold piece gold ring that identifies him as a low-level ranking member of the Thieves' Guild. Now you want the handout to be super cool, so what you're going to do is get a piece of parchment paper, roll it up and use it for the scroll, and on it you're going to write the Swine Gang's secret code word of the day, which is Tenderloin. Using the password will allow characters admittance into the Swine Gang's hideout called the Slaughterhouse, and any rogue will know where it's located in the cellars of a large tenement in a really bad section of town. Now, for extra credit, you're going to write the password Tenderloin in lemon juice. It will appear invisible, and the players have to get the idea to heat it up over a flame, and the magic word will be revealed. The slaughterhouse is a dungeon, and it's got five rooms. It's got a guard room, and if the player characters know that password, they'll automatically be admitted. And whether they want to kill the guards or pretend they're making a delivery to the head of the gang, whom they know is the butcher, that's up to them. The next room is the contraband room, where they store all their stolen goods. Three is a small sleeping quarters. Four is a loading dock. There's a river that leads into the sewers where the gang can transport their goods without any authorities noticing it. And five is the butcher's office, the butcher being the leader of the gang. He has the demon skull, that's what the asterisk indicates, and he's made it into a drinking cup and has no idea what's going on, but will try to chop the player characters into hamburger meat, assuming that this is a raid by a rival gang. Once he's down to the last few hit points, the assassin and Scabs suddenly show up. That's right, Scabs isn't dead. He hired the Green Scorpion cult to inject him with a poison that made it look like he died. Scabs wanted to steal the demon skull from the butcher, but he knew he wasn't strong enough to kill the entire swine gang, so he tricked the player characters into doing it for him. 
The plan is for the Green Scorpion assassin to finish the wounded characters off while Scabs attempts to steal the demon skull and eventually he's going to sell it to a demon worshipping cult. If the assassin died in Encounter C, this is a new, better assassin. And if the assassin survived that encounter, good. Now it's time to give the players an opportunity to get revenge and achieve some catharsis. If the player characters haven't really been injured, it's time to make some swine gang reinforcements arrive. If the player characters are severely wounded, maybe the Butcher joins them in attacking Scab. In any event, it's very possible that Scab or the Assassin or the Butcher get away, allowing you the opportunity to create a recurring villain. A good flowchart is an indispensable tool for any game master with any game system for any level characters. It provides a visual way for the game master can see all the important features at a glance, know where the, the player characters can go, and it has all the clues in bullet points so you don't miss or overlook any important information the player characters need to know. Even if you're running a professionally produced module, say from Wizards of the Coast, you want to make your own flowchart so you always know where the characters are going and you don't ever have to flip through the book for information. Now if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it on social media. Questions or comments, put them below. Also below you'll find links to our Facebook group and Patreon and you can check out other great Dungeon Craft videos over here. Once again, for Dungeon Craft, I am Professor Dungeon Master. Thanks so much for stopping by. I'll see you next time and until then, may all your rolls be twenties. <laughs>